Growth Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Travel Growth Podcast. I'm Tom McLaughlin, founder of SEO Travel, and this is where I speak to successful travel business leaders and dig into the successes, challenges, and learnings from their experiences over the years so you, the listener, can take away actionable advice to enhance your own businesses and maybe even lives too. My guest today is Becky Harris. Becky is one of the co-founders of Via Venture, a DMC in Central America, where she worked between 2001 and 2016. And since leaving that, she set up a range of businesses from SaaS products like Squirrelfish to Travel Kinship, her consultancy for DMCs, many of which are in the travel sector, some outside of that as well. So she's got lots of experience to bring to the table. I've known Becky for many years and she's never been short of ideas or enthusiasm for business. And she's a wonderful person, always looking to help others as the nickname Mother Teresa testifies, which she mentions when we speak. We go down all sorts of rabbit holes in this chat, including keeping focus, challenges with the traditional sales approach, and what to do when you leave the business that has been your life for 15 years. We also talk about the unsexy side of business with Becky, the new self-proclaimed queen of systems. And it's much more interesting than it sounds, I promise. Becky is a very open person and she shows a huge amount of vulnerability in this conversation about the challenges she faces as a single mum, dealing with loss of direction after she left by a venture and also how imposter syndrome can overcome you. But the main thing that came out of this for me was the depth of knowledge that Becky has from her experience. She's obviously got bags of practical knowledge from running a business for so long, but it's also clear how much time she's put into her own personal development over the years and she brings so much value here that people can lift from what she says and use for themselves. It was a real pleasure to spend this time with Becky, and I'm super grateful to her for everything that she shared, which I'm sure anyone listening to can benefit from on many levels, whether it's practical business advice or the empathy that comes from someone sharing their personal challenges so openly. So without further ado, here's me with Becky Harris. Becky, hello. Welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Thank you. How exciting. Thanks for inviting me. A pleasure. Lovely to have you on. Very excited to talk to you. Um... So obviously, we've known each other for quite a few years now, having having worked together back in the day with uh, with Via Venture, um, and yeah, it's great to be back in touch. You've got loads of experience in the industry, so I think there's going to be loads of stories and, and tidbits over throughout that people can tap into and, and learn from what you've done. Um, I think there's also because of your nature, there's loads of cool projects you've had on the go that have had challenges with them as well so you know I'm very much one for you know you learn more from those kind of things usually than you do from the big success stories oh I've got um, lots of failures to share (laughs) hey failures are good things yeah (laughs) absolutely absolutely so listen I know anyone who's listening to this will leave it with loads and loads of takeaways and you know again just from our brief conversation beforehand uh, you had some very cool stories uh to, to throw into it as well. So yeah, looking forward to getting into it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, so I thought as a starting point, we could kind of go back to the beginning and maybe you could just tell us about what first got you excited or got you into travel in the first place. Yeah, I was, I was reflecting on this. It's quite hard, isn't it? I mean, I, I spent five years of my life as a baby in Africa, in Ghana. My dad was working with the British Council. So from eight months to five years, I was in Africa. And I wonder if that did something. Um, And then when I, you know, I just wanted to travel from 13, I flew to Holland on my own. I wanted to go and see a girl I met on a campsite. Um, And then when I, you know, was at uni, we were traveling whenever we could. And when I was working up as an engineer, you know, we got six weeks holiday. We'd go away every year for for four weeks at a time. and at uni, I did um, one of the Erasmus schemes. So I learned Spanish and studied in Spain. So I didn't know, I was just constantly always with this. I don't know really where it came from, but I always wanted to be on an adventure and go traveling and, and meet people, you know, cum- accumulating in that really long 12 years in Latin America. Yeah, love it. Yeah, plenty to choose from there for the influence, eh? Um, yeah. Take, take us back then to the to the kind of... I guess going back to education and you can go a bit further back if you want, but give us the kind of run up to, I guess, to Via Venture. So maybe, you know, Via Venture is kind of the, the sort of 
place that you've spent such a long period of time. Um, mm. to give us the journey from, from education through to there and yeah, maybe the kind of five, five minute summary or however long it takes just to get to, to get to that point and all the stops along the way. Sure. I'll come back to each of them to, to tip into in more detail there. Yeah. Once you've gone yeah. Um, yeah, and just wink at me if I'm going on a bit, you know, kick me under the <laughs> table or something. Um, yeah, so um, I studied mechanical engineering at university, and as part of that, I actually worked in different countries, so Holland, Malaysia, and um, I just loved travel. And as I, I did about four years as a mechanical engineer, and at the end of it, I worked for ICI, and it was at that point when ICI was kind of cracking up a bit and starting to die. And my manager said, do you want to do like a marketing diploma or something to help you, you know, if you lose your job, um, you know, have different skills. And I jumped at the chance and um, I'd been in Peru traveling on holiday and had visited an orphanage. And I just had this kind of I think maybe a lot of us go through that at different points in our life, this wanting to give back and do something. So. I ended up researching uh, Save the Children and volunteering and kind of managed to push my way into uh, the, di the Latin America director's office one day in London and managed to, to get him to say, yes, come to Colombia and do some volunteering. Um, so I actually, I, <laughs> I left my job before they could sack me, which is always a good thing to do, right? Um, <laughs> obviously they were gonna sack me, I was gonna be one of the ones they kept on, but um, yeah, so I left my job and um, went off to Colombia. And um, I remember my, my, ma my manager at the time, who was quite a big wig in ICI, saying, yeah, I can't work out, Becky, whether you're going to be successful or not in, in business because you're too much of a Mother Teresa. And I thought, I thought, I'll take that as a compliment. I'm not sure if it was meant as one, but I'll take it. Um, so I flew off to Colombia. I'm not, I have no idea to this day what my parents thought at this point. I was 22 and it wasn't that, it was 90, ooh, 96, 98. So it wasn't, you know, it was, it was still a bit rocky in certain areas. Um, and I, I remember arriving at the airport and the uh, UK director for Colombia or Latin America, or whatever, met me off the plane and he said, um, you know, that project that you've come over to work for, oh, we didn't get funding, so we don't have anything for you to do. And I'd literally just text my whole career in, you know. Wow. So anyway, um, I was taken in by a friend of a very good friend of mine now, Dina Alloy, who was working there at the time. And um, she let me live in her apartment and I did Spanish lessons and I traveled around Colombia to the bits you were allowed to travel around to at that time. Um, I remember like sleeping in hammocks in Parque Terona and just, I mean, Colombia is just gorgeous and they've done such a great job of their marketing um, in, the, in the last decade or so. Um, and I just had the most incredible time. And, and Dina was, you know, my savior. She managed to get me um, a position in Save the Children Sweden in Peru, which is Radabanan. And so I had this epic journey from Colombia to Peru, where I went down to the south of Colombia into the Amazon, got on a boat and, you know, like a, a little boat with all the locals and went through the Amazon into Peru to Iquitos. And then a lorry and there was like a landslide and we had to walk around and pick up another bus and all the way down basically to, to Lima to start working for Save the Children in, in Lima, Radaban. And because the, they kind of, you know, they formed this kind of um, group of all the Save the Children. And I worked there for about, well, I volunteered and then they gave me a job and I worked there uh, for a year, traveled, you know, all over Peru, another country I adore. Um, just had the most incredible time. Um, and then I guess it was, I don't know, I guess it felt like time to move on. And I ended up traveling from Lima up overland, um, up, up through Ecuador, flew to Panama, Panama, you know, did the, the thing. Got as far as Guatemala, which of course we all know now I love the most. Um, <clears throat> and then um, was... Um, met some met an Israeli guy in a in a lodge as you do when you're backpacking and he had this car that he brought down from Florida and being 20 whatever and a bit dumb I thought that's a great idea I'll buy that off you because he was going down south and I was going north so I said oh can I buy that oh he was trying to sell it and um, so I bought this car off him um 
And I didn't have my driving license with me and I didn't think about insurance or any of those things um, and just then started driving. So then drove through Belize, Mexico, made up something about losing my driving license in Mexico with the police <laughs> so I could get some kind of documentation. I think my mum must have eventually faxed something over I don't know but you know I fluffed it somehow uh, as you you don't worry do you when you're that age about anything happening um and of course my 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 grand plan was that because I had this car you know it wasn't flash that I would pick up all these great you know gorgeous guys and like drive through Mexico um (laughs) and um if you read my emails at the time which my mum diligently printed out which is incredible all my hotmail emails Um, it was like, oh, God, this guy is like a right smelly hippie or, you know, the crazy <laughs> Polish guy. All the women I met were amazing. They were brilliant, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, and I remember in the Yucatan, so I hadn't been going very long and um, the car was an automatic and I'm British, so I wasn't used to an automatic. And um, and it had one of those weird little things with the safety belt, you know, it felt like a really rubbish 60s sci-fi thing, you know. Um, anyway, it got stuck in third gear in the Yucatan and I took it to all these garages and they couldn't work it out. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be stuck in like third gear. And I thought, oh, well, never mind. I'm just going to Mexico in Crack third on. gear. <laughs> <laughs> what else am I going to do, right? <laughs> nice. Um, Love it. And then some magically, the car gods, um, I must have lit the right candle and um, it freed <laughs> up and, and I could drive normally. And I mean, it was the most incredible time. Mexico I mean it's so vast it's so different it's so gorgeous um you know and this was in I guess 2000 yeah because I'd been in Cuba yeah. for the millennium um oh that's another quick hilarious story do you know you know you know EastEnders so yeah, back yeah. in 1999 there was Colin who was part of this gay couple in EastEnders and we met him in a nightclub in a cave in somewhere in Cuba um <laughs> on the millennium yeah that's one of my favorite wow. things <laughs> anyway, um, so I keep driving through Mexico, um, go up through the States. Um, where did we go? We went up the middle to Denver, down to LA, up the coast, along, and then up to Toronto. I, I'm not sure, like three months must be more, the whole trip. Um, mm. And basically, yeah, it was. we arrived in Toronto in a, in a snowstorm. Well, I arrived, sorry, me and the car. Because the car's called Priscilla, obviously. It has a personality. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, must have been personified at some point. <laughs> <laughs> it had all stupid things stuck to the, you know, that I'd picked up along the journey. And I had crosses yeah. hanging from the mirror. And in fact, I got stopped by the cops in Ohio or somewhere. Um, uh, because, and their, their excuse was, oh, madam, you're not allowed, or ma'am, you're not allowed to have things hanging from your mirror. But I think they just thought I looked a bit dodgy. Yeah, um, yeah. And so then I left my car in Toronto with Dina again. You see how Dina features so much. She was literally nice. my saviour. And um, what happened next? Oh, then I went back to Britain and I did some work for like a business corporate responsibility company. I because you know that thread of helping people. Um, I, I thought mm-hmm. that was great. The mix of it was kind of new at that time. You know, businesses building that into their corporate strategy and and their staff. Um, but when I was in LA, I met someone who worked for ICI who I knew and she was looking for a replacement. So I ended up applying for an engineering job in LA, got it. And so ICI I paid huge amounts of money to get my visa sorted. Um, they even shipped Priscilla down from Toronto. Um, and I think I told you that, you know, when I, I was at, it was National Starch, which was part of ICI in, in LA. And, um, this lorry rocks up in front of the office um, because they've shipped my car and they roll the car out of the back of the lorry, which has come obviously from Toronto. And the guy's like, I can't believe they paid to ship this car from Toronto. The worst thing is it only lasted about like eight months and then jacked it in because I couldn't, I don't know, I guess I still had that travel bug. Um, But it was a really interesting job. It was at the time of Six Sigma and all the quality improvements, you know, Black Belt, Six Sigma and all that, um, you know, improving efficiencies and effectiveness. So it was a really interesting job for a while. Um, but then in L.A. Sure. I met James and um, 
that's that's basically in a coffee shop where we had the idea um, well I had the idea to do something like with incentive travel in Guatemala he'd been to Guatemala that's how we got to know each other through a friend um, and um, yeah we had this idea to set up something in Guatemala um, we came up with the name Via Venture which was meant to mean or Via Venture everyone calls it different um, and it was meant to mean kind of through travel or through adventure sorry you know so the idea that you get experience or you you know like transformational travel and they call it you know it's one of the things mentioned these days but that was the idea that you know gain something through travel and um we popped up and down to Guatemala a few times we drove a truck down with a bunch of kayaks and a barbecue um and then we eventually moved down there and and properly set up via venture and Amazing. um so, so 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 what year was that when are we when are we talking that that was established so i think 2001 um yeah was when we kind of were in guatemala and yeah because the, I was still traveling in the Malay. So 2001, yeah, was when we, yeah. we started okay. by adventure. Yeah. So give us a, I think at this point, rather than kind of, cat, we'll come back to like pick the story up again once we've covered some of the via venture stuff. So give us the picture of when you moved down there. So did you fully move and go to Guatemala to run it out of Guatemala or were you running it out of out of the US and just popping down from time to time? What did, what did it look like when you were first starting out? When we first, first started, we were in a flat in Glendale, LA, um, sleeping on a mattress on the floor, you know, boxes as, um, boxes as our kind of tables. And um, we had a fax machine in the kitchen because in those days, you know, it was really faxes was the way. So we were faxing hotels in Guatemala to get their rate. Um, I've got some old photos of me in front of a whiteboard pretending I knew what I was doing. Um, yeah, so I don't know how long we did that for. Um, and then finally, I think we just decided we needed to be down there. Um, so we moved down. And I've got, I've got pictures of us living in really horrendous places in Antigua. Um, I remember us having like straw mattresses. Oh, yeah. And James's mother lent us her horse packing boxes. So she used to go horse packing into the in the back country in California. She had these like big metal boxes that would turn into a stove and storage. And we brought those down on one of the trucks and that was our kitchen. Um, so, yeah, we, um, you know, we, we, I mean, early days we met Biat, Biat Brunschwiler, and he was already in Antigua and he had this great um, mountain biking and hiking and kind of outdoorsy outfitter and, um, I remember him being so suspicious of us when when we first met him. I think he thought we were going to like steal all his info and, you know, because um, there was a lot of that going around, a lot of competition. Um, but we ended up partnering up together and renting offices together. And um, we set up Cafe Sky, which, um, you know, you know what it's like at the beginning of a business and you don't quite know what's going to take off. So, you know, we had this great rooftop area above our office so we ended up just building a, a cafe bar up there which we then sold and I think still going today so if you go anyone goes to Antigua go to Cafe Sky uh, it's got an amazing view of the volcanoes so we used to sit drinking beers and watching the volcano would erupt at night and there'd be like lava and stuff not every day wow. but yeah so um, what, what made you did you did you make that as like a separate source of income or was it something to do with the team and like having a place for the team to go or yeah just a random idea you went with yeah at that point there was only me James Biat and Luis Lopez who's the longest standing he's still at via venture now um amazing guy and um we had the office and then there was like a staircase up to the top and we would after work we would just go up with a few a uh, few beers um and just hang out and so i think that's where we got the idea that oh this would be a great bar up here so um and we also thought that's a great way to drink for free um so we ended up working all day in the office and then and then working all evening in the bar um so but you know that age it was just such an adventure and um we had john from cafe no say who was just starting cafe no say at the time and we would all hang out together. And if he ran out of beer, we'd lend him some of our beer. And if I, we ran out of beer, he'd lend us some. 
you know, and he's now like mega famous with his illegal tequila and mezcal, sorry, mezcal. Um, and Cafe Nose is like another very famous place to go if you're, if you're hanging out in Antigua. Right. Um, and it was just... Is that no say know, as in, I don't know? Yeah, Cafe No Say. Yeah, yeah, like it. Like it. <laughs> Which by the you know by the time you leave you really don't know anything yeah yeah <laughs> um, and it was great you know I remember we had like big white ball like pieces of paper where we were writing out the trips and aligning the trips to work like before we had any software to work out who's in country and what's happening and you know doing the accounts and stuff um, and it just it just really grew I think it was a case of right time right place you know i mean we've, we've talked yeah. about this before like you know loads of people have great business ideas loads of people have are very clever but there is i think still an element of luck in it you know and maybe personality and you know there's a, there's a whole raft of things isn't there and i think yeah being british and and you know i think we were kind of the first to really think about tailor-made travel in in guatemala and the first to really promote the fact that there was luxury product and there was really cool adventure product. Um, and buyers seemed to, to really like that. Um, so yeah. yeah, we grew, we grew really, really, really fast. Um, so so run, us, run us through that then, run us through the, yeah, because you got to what, about 50 staff eventually at a, at a certain point. So. I how yeah. did you find that process of going from, yeah, you and James and Biat just doing your own thing to having all these people that you had to look after and no doubt all the baggage that comes with that? Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, I mean, I think we went through the stages that probably every, you know, entrepreneur, to small business size, medium business size goes through. So um, I think we went from, you know, small and lean and everybody, you know, doing three jobs um, to overstaffed and flabby. And actually the recession of 2008 probably did us a real favor. And interestingly enough, probably COVID, even though I'm not there now, has obviously been devastating, but it, it, these things do really kind of refocus you on the most effective way to run a business. And I think you lose sight of that a little bit as you grow. <clears throat> so in the early days, I think one of the great, two great things we did early was um, build our own software. Um, and I, any DMC out there, I think that's the best investment you can make early on in your business. I mean, not really early on, but as you start to grow, to have some kind of buy, you know, there's lots of great software out there now um, to kind of systematize your system and, and be as effective and efficient as possible and build that really strong foundation from where you can grow. I mean, it's just, it's priceless, you know? Um, so that was one thing we did. And the other thing we did was um, an accounting system, which sounds simple and probably most Western businesses would, would have that in place. But at the time, you know, QuickBooks Online was kind of a new thing. So um, I think we employed that nice and early too, which helped us, um, you know, get a, a report on financial and marketing things and actually see how is the business performing really, because if you just look at the money coming in, that doesn't tell you anything. Um, so I, I think, you know, keeping a good financial eye on what's actually prof, what, what profits you have. And, and certainly for us, our profit, mar, you know, our profit margins decreased as we got bigger. And I think mm. lots of businesses maybe find that trying to keep effective and efficient as you grow um, is, is I think quite difficult. Um, so yeah, what happened, so then we, you know, we'd moved offices, we grew, we were, we were going to a lot of travel shows. Um, we were picking up a lot of business every time we went to a travel show. We invested a lot of money because uh, obviously they're not cheap. Um, we would go to TMLA every year, um, Pure. We went from the minute it started, we were there every year, um, mm. still are. Um, LATA, you know, Latin, Latin America Travel Association in Britain, when they started their show, we would go to that, still do. Um, we went to a lot of incentive shows. I mean, I was the lucky person that got to fly around the world, uh, meet people. Um, but uh, as people know, it's not all fun. It is hard work. Yeah, but it's, absolutely. But yeah. There's something amazing, you know, that I think we've all missed during the pandemic about 
um, that networking and that camaraderie. And especially when you live in a more remote country, uh, in a more remote area of that country, you know, and you're not surrounded by, you know, like in Britain, there's so many travel industry people and there's so many events and you, you always feel supported and there's always something to go to. And, but, you know, when you live in Antigua, Guatemala or, you know, people in other countries, you can feel very isolated. Um, and I think going to travel shows, yes, you're trying to get business. Yes, you're meeting your existing clients and improving business, but also you're kind of, ear to the ground what what's the trends going on um it's feeling supported by other people what what do you, what are the pressures you're you know under um and i think you know with the pandemic and the fact that we now do a lot of this online meeting it's great because i think you know people who live in live in different countries can now find ways to network and feel supported and, and learn from each other in much more easily and, and much cheaper um, but yeah, certainly, yeah. yeah, that was the main thing we did to grow in those years was to get out there to the travel shows, uh, join associations. What about the raw kind of growing of, of the team? Obviously, that's quite a lot of people. Mm. You know, I, you've, you've mentioned to me uh, some interesting practices in uh, recruiting and uh, things you had to go through. So give us a bit of background on that. <laughs> yeah, so we, we were growing a lot and... I mean, recruitment is just the hardest thing, isn't it? I think mo I think every business has this. And we were in Antigua, so we weren't in Guatemala City. So it was quite hard to attract um, professional staff. And we didn't want people who'd been in the travel industry necessarily because we wanted to, we didn't want them to come with their own systems. Um, you know, so um we had a lot of people who weren't from who didn't go to university and we would have a lot of training schemes etc and we got quite big um and then we had some money go missing and um things going missing and um we asked around you know the businesses in in that we knew and so what what do people typically do and they said oh we get um we get like a security company to come in and interview everybody and if necessary do lie detector tests and we were like, oh God, is that is that legal? And they're like, yeah, yeah. So we did that, and it, we found out who who stole the money. Um, and then everyone said, yeah, yeah, we, don't you don't you do that as part of your recruitment? Um, and um, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, aren't I? But um, <laughs> yeah. So then it's a different we were, place, isn't it? Interesting. It is. It is. And um, it's not. And it, you know, it's kind of standard practice. And it's. I don't want people to think that you know people are, are, are you know got electrodes on them i mean most of it is just uh, an interview process but it it really helped us um because i mean it is a serious thing we have lived through um certain threats and and certain things that have happened that you know are very difficult and what you're trying to do really is make sure that the wrong people don't infiltrate your business at the same time it does help uh you know find good people um but yeah that was one of the things that that we did at that time um and you know just over the years we learned how to you know set people certain tasks because you don't have to know anything about travel but you have to know about customer service and reading an email and you know thinking about what western travelers uh are looking for and you know, giving great responses and, and showing your knowledge and kind of, you know, one of the things I would say about the sales team is you are actually training your client at the same time as giving them a quote, like the more mm. information options, you know, and the quoting process, you know, that's one of my uh, bugbears or one of my things I think people don't think about enough and train their staff enough on because speed is everything, isn't it? Especially these days. And we're in competition with, you know, online sales and and we're at different time zones around the world and so when you know the quoting process is so important and it still kills me how people keep sending emails and don't pick up the phone it's like if you want a quick mm. thing pick up the phone and if you want to give a quick answer pick up the phone and get all the information you need quickly uh give all the options um, but even if you're not on the phone you know within within the quoting process make sure you think deeply about what the client wants or might want or what they haven't thought about 
and just give them everything in that first email, mm. give them options. I'm a big um, supporter of breakdown pricing. You know, I think, uh, you know, we've got to interact in a way that's efficient and effective and, and helps create a sale. Bit of a tangent there, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think you're right. It is, uh, you know, the consultative selling thing kind of, you know, it, it, going back to the recruitment side of it, it's, I guess it's getting people based more on values and yeah, rather than sort of, like you say, judging them on their, their current skills. Yeah, like, you're right. You know, Value. The saying of, you can teach anyone. Yeah, no, sorry. I cut you off then. I'm such a blabbermouth. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, values is maybe slightly different, but it, absolutely important because, you know, I think we were trying to create a, a strong culture in Via Venture of, you know, sustainable travel and good business practices and fair business practice. I mean, we always paid our staff <clears throat> over over the norm and, and expected, you know, good service. But also you're right, like it's the character of the person. I mean, sales is such a hard job. Well, it's all a hard job, isn't it? Operations is a crazy job too. Um, I mean, you know, you never know when the phone's going to ring and there's a problem with the van or the hotel or whatever. That's what we called operations, you know, in the field, guiding, driving, um, but yeah, in the sales team, you know, you have to be fast but um, precise. You know, you don't you're dealing with a lot of money. You can't make mistakes. Sometimes you get irate clients, um, not very nice clients. We've talked about that as well, haven't we? That you know, one of the things I don't like in the travel industry <clears throat> is some buyers. Obviously, you know, a small percentage of buyers treat suppliers like the slaves, like you know. Um, don't treat them really with respect and ultimately you are nothing without your supplier and, and to me it's about building a really strong relationship between the buyer and the supplier and uh, <clears throat> trust and creativity and you know working together to develop new products new ways of selling um, and and you know actually you know us training the supplier sales team but also training the buyer's sales team because we rely on them doing a great job to make sure that they sell in in a in a real way, and so I get I get really upset when I when I hear of buyers treating uh, sales teams badly. And actually, we did we actually did tell a few buyers to, to we didn't want to do business with them anymore because of 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 you know how they would treat the sales team and actually how their clients treated um, our supply our suppliers. So the restaurants and the hotels. I never forget. I had to write an email to all the suppliers on a particular trip, and so we're and apologize for the way they were treated by the, the people who traveled and um wow yeah yeah i mean the thing your, your values are only as good as you're sticking to them aren't they so if you you can write all your things on a on a website in a list in your promotional material but yeah if you don't if you don't stand by them when you're when you're doing it they're not yeah they're not really uh they're not really worth it are they well i was just gonna say quickly i think that's the pressure of working in the luxury travel industry because um <clears throat> i mean a lot of people in luxury are, are great, but there are a certain element of luxury travelers who kind of just want something and th and they're throwing you a lot of money. And, you know, it, it takes it takes values to say, no, I'm sorry, you can give me as much money as you want, but that certain thing is not possible, you know. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So you also had a trio of leaders when you were at Via Venture. So you, James and Bia, as I understand it. So. Tell us about the challenges of that situation, how it worked, how it didn't work. <laughs> what was the what was the experience like? Yeah, I mean it's it's a long time ago, and it, so my memory's a bit fuzzy. But um, yeah, there was there was three of us, and James was my partner at the time. <clears throat> so there was an added kind of uh, you know added thing there as well, and. Um, we never really appointed anyone as, you know, the CEO. We were all equal, equal shares. Um, and as the company grew, you know, we kind of assigned each other different areas of the business. Um, I think it worked really well in the sense that we, you know, we all had different uh, personalities and different strengths, you know, like Biat, who very sadly passed away um, this year, last year sorry we're now um yeah uh, was you know he was a genius on um, the operations 
um, you know, he's the person who came up with the, the amazing beyond experiences that they have, the glamping. Um, so, you know, he, he took that role quite naturally. <clears throat> and, um, and I kind of, I was sales and marketing, and then I couldn't do both. So then I was marketing and James um, was sales. And so we kind of kept to kept to ourselves a bit and that and that worked. And then we would have kind of strategic meetings every year and, and try and set a strategy for the company. I mean, it's it's difficult. I mean, working with your, you know, your partner, your I mean, we weren't married, but <clears throat> it's really tricky. You know, um, it's fine when everything's going well, but it's, you know, it's when there's conflict and it, it, it it's just hard it's just hard um but to be honest i think we did we did pretty well for many years you know and then when when james and i split up i did try and and keep going but it was just it was just really difficult and i think I, in the end i found that i just wasn't giving 100 percent. you know my heart just wasn't in it and so i decided that it was better that i left um but I so think, when was that? When when did that happen? When did you? When did, you when did I leave? So we stood up in two thousand nine. So 10, 11, 12, 2012, 13, I can't quite remember. Um, mm. Yeah, and I think that's something for any business um, is to be clear on the the leadership structure. I think ultimately you need someone in charge of of leadership and making sure the strategy happens i think the big problem is accountability you know if you don't have somebody in charge making sure that everyone's accountable and that the people you know the managers or directors <clears throat> respect that chain of command um it's hard to make sure that that things move forward and important things move forward like we were talking about before you know there's lots of non-sexy bits to running a business and, and, you know, people can shy away from doing them unless it's part of the strategic plan and everyone knows they have to happen and everyone knows who's in charge of, of doing those things and that they're held accountable for it. Um, and also so that things move at pace, you know, otherwise then you mm -hmm. can like start lagging behind the competition. Um, it's it's not enough to just stand still these days. You know, you've got to keep moving forward and... and um, I think now more than ever, you know, if, if you're out there listening and you've, you've got a DMC and coming out of pandemic, I mean, now is a crucial time, I think, to be out there um, marketing, you know, relationship building, product developing, you know, what does a new type of traveler want now? Are you sure you've got that? Can you deliver it, et cetera? Are you picking yeah, up new yeah. business? Um, so, yeah, it was tricky. <clears throat> it was tricky. And um I think, you know, that whole, what we were talking about with, with, with um, recruitment too, is, is having a really good um, HR structure, a good organizational chart where everyone's very clear on their roles and responsibilities, what they're meant to be doing. I mean, we've tried very hard to implement a decent HR program where we'd hold personal reviews, set goals, you know, um, every year sit down did you know what did they meet their goals what were the issues you know that and that is non-sexy work it's really difficult and to get managers to do that and to, to do it well rather than just box ticking but it's so important mm -hmm. you know what's your strategy that golden thread coming through what's your strategy what's your role in achieving that strategy all the way down through the organization and I don't think many I don't think enough companies think about that properly I think a lot of companies just kind of doing the day-to-day -day and and getting through it you know but it's more yeah. than just getting more sales in you know yeah have you got any advice on how to do that like what um yeah any structures or systems or anything that yeah that helps you do that i mean it, i think it's quite a simple process and the more you do it you get better at doing it <clears throat> i mean basically get the leadership team to sit down and do um a strength, you know, a SWOT analysis. Just sit and brainstorm a SWOT analysis. What do you think your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats are? And spend a lot of time doing that and thinking about 
you know, areas we know we should be better at what's going on in the market, you know, bring people in, bring buyers in to talk about what they think is going on in the market and just spend a lot of time really going over that. And then from that, starting to prioritize, you know, <clears throat> what really needs to be done now and then later um, and basically build that into a strategy. You know, what are the different areas? What's the financial stuff? What's the marketing stuff? What's the organi you know, operational system, HR, financial and just kind of map out um, a strategy. And then I, I, with my clients now at Travel Kinship, follow the OKR process. And it all sounds, you know, fancy. And, but really all it is, is saying, in these next three months, what are the three key things we have to do? And then someone meeting you regularly and keeping you accountable. And I think the biggest problem for companies is not necessarily doing the strategy but it's implementing the strategy and we, we all get busy and I think it's having somebody keep you accountable and somebody constantly saying is that a priority is that is that the, is that the priority why haven't you done it you know when are you going to do it and um, I always in the back of my mind have that great matrix and I've forgotten who came up with it I think it's pretty old which is the urgent and important and the fact that so many of us spend so much time in that quadrant two, which is not important, but urgent, the firefighting, you know, mm -hmm. and actually we all need to block out time in the quadrant. I can't remember, but maybe I got the numbers wrong, but you know, the other quadrant, which is important and um, an urgent, which is the, you know, the not, the, urgent. not urgent, but important. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is, you know, building those foundational, it's like implementing a really implementing systems. You know, I've got friends now and mm -hmm. clients who are implementing different systems. I mean, it takes three months, six months. And the early, that's why the earlier you can do it when your company is not so complex. Um, but it's really hard to do because we're all so busy and there's emails flying in and, and I get it. And that's why, you know, if you can employ someone to, or even make someone in your organization, um, give them that role to kind of, um, what's the word in a meeting, um, you know, facilitate the process, yeah. uh, keep the notes, keep people on track. Um, I mean, we tried it many times in BioVenture and it, it's, it is, it's really hard without someone really mm. doing that and yeah. keeping an eye on it. That was one of the things that, um, yeah, when I first started working with a coach, the accountability thing was probably the biggest thing for me. It was, you know, as, as I think we'll maybe come on to in a little while, just when you are kind of leading the business and you're the founder of the business and you kind of, no one else is telling you what to do or when to do it or anything like that. You need someone to force you to do those things. Like my, you know, my background and my way is definitely not the systemizing things and processes is definitely not my strong point. So I needed someone to crack the whip and make sure that I was, I was doing those things. So yeah, it's, I think it's super, super important. If, if we just go from there to back, I guess, back into the timeline. So you have this time at Viaventure, then as you said, gets to the point where you feel like you're, you're ready to leave and, and move on. What, what happens from then to now? Fill, fill the gap from, from then to now. Oh gosh. Um, yeah, I got very lost. Um, I, I, when I was at Viaventure, I remember someone telling me about, um, a friend of theirs who had quite a big travel company selling it and how they spent quite a few years after not knowing what to do with themselves. And I remember thinking at the time, Oh God, how ridiculous, you know, of course you just get on and do something new. And, um, you know, I think I left Viaventure with, quite an ego in, a, in an understated British way of course but you know quite an ego in the sense of I was really proud of of what I you know my part in in growing via venture and I guess and it had become a success very quickly and I think I thought well I can just start something else again quickly like why why wouldn't that happen um but at the same time I didn't realize that I just was I was really lost I didn't really know what I wanted to do and um, I as an entrepreneur you know how most companies have the entrepreneur and the systems person you know they always use Apple as the example you know the, the guru entrepreneur yeah. ideas person but the 
person who really does the work and makes sure the company works. And I think I'm a bit too much right brain um, ideas. And I basically spent all my savings um, setting up different things and, and I kept finding the next new shiny thing. Um, so my first thing was um, social enterprise. Like I really wanted to start a social enterprise. Uh, the Mother Teresa thing coming up again, you know. Um, but I didn't really have a good idea how to do that. So um, I set up, I did, you know, I set up Warrior Princess and um, I set up another business, which I still haven't um, launched called uh, Dreamcatcher with my daughter. Um, and, um, and I set up, uh, I spent quite a lot of time with a digital company, digital marketing company called Round Creative. And that was really fascinating because for the first time I really learned about SEO and I learned about building websites and I learned about social media and I did quite a lot of reading. And so it wasn't wasted time because I, I learned a lot of stuff and I did a, I did an online course in digital, but you know, all the time my money is dwindling because I'm obviously I'm not earning at this point. Um, and then I came up with the idea of Squirrelfish, which is, you know, software to help facilitate the buyer seller relationship. Um, and that, you know, that sucked a huge amount of, of money. Um, so all these things are, are kind of going on and I'm kind of dividing my time. And then I set up Travel Kinship, the consultancy, and then somebody comes along and says, oh, why don't you set up a, I'd love to set up a travel agency with you. So then I set up Curious Travel. So now I've got like. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty to keep you busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it got ridiculous. And, you know, and I'm a single mum. So I was, you know, I was 50-50 with James. You know, we've always done that. Um, so, you know, you're one week you're a mum taking kids to school kid to school and picking up and taking to brownies and whatever and then the next week you're you're not you know you're you're you and I've always struggled with those two different weeks and how to um manage my time and prioritize and focus I, I find that really hard um but eventually I basically let certain things kind of go to the wayside and when the pandemic hit, I basically focused in on travel kinship, which is what I've been doing since the pandemic hit, which is probably not the best timing. Um, but actually it's, it's been great. Um, so yeah, definitely not a good idea people to start too many things at once. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true though, isn't it? You, you, you know, this is the mistake. Well, this is a thing that, so many people do exactly as you described it it's their inclination to come up with great ideas but then not kind of see it through or yeah they don't enjoy that piece that is the kind of next stage of turning it into a into a thing and it's it's such an easy trap to fall into uh, you know i'm the same i i uh, you know since i started seo travel i've had myriad things in the background ticking along and yeah it got to a stage where I had to kind of stop and have a word with myself and say, look, you've got a good thing here. Start, start spending your time on, on that. And rather than trying to find some magic, you know, diamond in the rough over here, it's like, you've, you've got it kind of do, do something with that. So, um, yeah. so I do, you know, I do think it is a very common thing to do, but I guess it's the, it's the way up of, exactly as you've described it like what's the thing that you put the effort into like why why do you do that so where where are you at the moment with that kind of conversation with yourself is it have you have you you said you're putting more focus on travel travel kinship is and you know is that the plan to zone in on that or is you know you're still trying to juggle a few things what yeah where, where have you rested on it at the moment i'm still juggling a few things i think what I mean, travel kinship is my focus, but squirrelfish because it's it's there, and I do believe in it, and um, I, I'm keeping that ticking along, and people are using it, and I think one day I'll find some kind of maybe co-founder or funding to kind of take it take it further. But um, the other thing, the thing that I've managed to do much better now is block out time in my diary. So now I have a schedule of which days I work on which businesses. And obviously, travel kinship, I need to be answering emails every day. But if I block out time for squirrelfish, 
So I'm still kind of keeping Curious Travel, Squirrel Fish and Travel Kinship all ticking along. Um, unfortunately, they're all to do with the travel industry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, I did do a selling on Amazon course during the pandemic, but um, so far I'm, I'm just sticking to travel. But the interesting thing is they do all complement each other. So they make sense. Um, and um, yeah, there's the, there's the DMC thread through these things, isn't there? I guess the, yeah, that, you know, and that experience that you've had historically that you're bringing all that knowledge that you've got of what the challenges were. So, you know, squirrel fish is the, you know, the tool that they can use to kind of resolve some of the problems that you see between the buyer and the seller. And then, yeah, as travel kinship obviously is like the more consultative thing. Maybe you could do. Maybe you could give us a quick summary of what each of those things are, Becky. That might be a good overview to feed into some sure. of the stuff. Well, so Curious Travel is a is a travel agency. I mean, tour operator really, because obviously we work direct with DMCs, um, and that that's very small. It's me and Helena, and um, is all based on digital marketing through the through the website. Um, then uh, travel kinship is, I mean, it's it's more than a representation company. So I work with about seven or eight DMCs, and yes, I go out there and, and try and get them new business. Um, but also, um, I try and help them with whatever they you know, whatever they need help with. So it's more of a consultancy as well, because obviously I ran a DMC for a long time. And with Curious Travel, I, I can, and now I've got the, both sides of the story. Um, and, the, and the big thing is helping them be more effective, more efficient systems, customer service, um, you know, and product development. Um, and I'd like to develop Travel Kinship further. Uh, one of my big things is, is helping smaller companies get um, higher profile and get help. So uh, one of the things I want to do is set up an online training program that's very inexpensive. So whether you're, you know, you're starting up a small safari company in Uganda or, you know, um, you can access it and start to get an idea, start to get some learning on, you know, for 20 bucks, you can at least get some learning on something. And also so that you don't have to kind of have a huge training program. You can go, well, at the moment I'm struggling with, strategy so I'll go and get the strategy program and then I'm struggling with SEO so we'll go and get Tom's Tom's uh, pro <laughs> program <laughs> on SEO <Solid>. um, <laughs> we'll work on that together soon um, <laughs> yeah and then the other piece of it is that we do all my DMCs we try and meet every couple of months and share best practice and talk about what's, what's um, bothering them and I'd like to extend that out to kind of have other DMCs, um, non-competing DMCs, have an opportunity to meet regularly and discuss issues and, and have it more like, and have guest speakers, not guest speakers, but guests come in and talk about mm. so that they can, they can, you know, find out more. So actually, you know, discuss the quoting process with buyers of different types, because that's the other thing. Not everybody wants their quotes done in the same way. Um, so yeah, that's kind of travel kinship. And then uh, Squirrel Fish is, um, is a platform for buyers and sellers. Um, it's kind of like LinkedIn for the travel industry. So the idea is you um, can go in and as a supplier, you can go in and find buyers and try and connect. Uh, and once you've connected, the buyer then gets access to all your resources. So it's also a digital asset management system. So suppliers can upload all their images, videos, example itineraries if you're a hotel you can put your spa menu you know uh fact sheets etc um but it's you know i got frustrated with, as a buyer um that everyone uses dropbox and google and there's like millions of folders to go through and you there's bad titles and you can't find what you need um so it's it's aimed at being useful for a supplier it, to use it itself for its own staff you know i need a swimming pool photo you type in swimming pool and photos you know, that have that come up. Um, so it's, you can download different sizes of images, you can download horizontal, vertical, you know, whatever. So it's much easier to find what you're looking for and organize things. Uh, but also the buyer, my idea was that you go in and then you've got access to all your suppliers in one place. 
you know, you're not going to this person's website over here, laboriously downloading one at a time, or then going in somebody else's Dropbox. So say you're doing, you know, best swimming pools of the world, you literally type in pool and images from all your suppliers that are titled pool or have that category or tag pop up and you can kind of look through. Mm. So we're trying to kind of get us more into this, I think the new digital way of like, you search rather than folders, you know? Um, and yeah. it kind of forces suppliers to be more professional about how they deal with their uh, resources, you know, and be more, you know, put decent titles on. Otherwise, when you download it, you don't know what that's a photo of. And then it helps the buyer when they upload it for their SEO, if there's a really good title, like small things yeah. like that, you know. All those, yeah, All it's. I think it's a great idea. All, all the, you know, it's a big problem that we see with our, you know, not necessarily just DMCs, but just in general across the industry, like imagery, what to do with it and how to find things. And, you know, I, I think it's just something that people just don't pay enough attention to. And then it becomes too big a problem to overcome and they're just kind of drowned yeah. in it. And like you say, you're just getting it delivered in all different formats. One minute, someone's a Dropbox. Some people have got it in Google Drive. Some people just send you off to a stock site and say, get something from there because we can't, we can't in any way deliver something that you want. And it holds their whole business back and their whole brand back. So I, do, you know, I think having something there that um, yeah, allows people to just zone in and, and do it is a, is, a, is a great thing. So um, like you say, as a, like as a business plan, it's a great, it's a great thing as well because you, if you can get it structured as a tool and then, yeah, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean more legs and more hours every time. Well, and what's fascinating is it's one of those segment jobs, isn't it? And what you said is so true. That's what I see. And that's a barrier to people using it, actually, is that mm. they've got things all over the place and they know they need to organize it, but they're not prioritizing that. And I just had a little conflab on LinkedIn um, with, with some people who say exactly what you're saying, you know, and what I'm seeing. Um, that people have stuff all over the place, badly titled, but they don't think of it as a priority. So they don't say, okay, I'm going to spend a week or I'm going to pay someone to come in and sort this out for me. But they should, because it's really a priority. I mean, if you have a hotel or you have a DMC, it's gold dust. I mean, people are crying out for unique images, especially videos, um, you know, so prioritizing also budgeting to have them you know, new images and new videos done every year, but then organizing it and making it easily available. The other thing we were saying was how, like, you look on someone's website and there's all these great videos and images and you go on their Instagram, there's incredible photos, and then you ask for their resources and none of them are there. And you're like, where yeah. are all the good ones, you know? Yeah, it's, it, yeah, I think, um, I wonder if you could, yeah, what's the incentive to get people to do it? You know, I guess it just wants to be like, you almost want the column of how many bookings do you need to cover this cost to do it once and see how, you know, see how extensive that would be. Because if it's not big, then you can kind of say, oh, you, you, will you get five more bookings or 10 more bookings or however much it costs to get someone in there just to spend the time? Because it's, it's not necessarily an expensive job to put someone onto it, is it? Um, or, you know, the amount of, Maybe you want the sort of missing out kind of idea of how many bookings are you losing because of bad imagery or not sending it to, you know, other, not giving the salespeople, the, you know, the information and the, the assets that they need to sell, sell a trip. Um, I don't want it to turn into a yeah, brainstorming session, Becky, but I, yeah, I, 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 you know, there's definitely like a thing there. It's, it's interesting. No, it is interesting because it's very hard to measure because I know as a buyer, I have not done a blog on something because it was too hard to find their images. So yeah. it's very hard because you don't know how many times someone hasn't promoted your hotel or your country because it was too much of a faff to find good images. And I never forget yeah. talking to A and K and them wanting us to do an interview and do something with us for their magazine. And they, and I was like, wow, I can't believe you're doing that on Guatemala. And they were like, well, we just know you won't mess around and you'll give us what we need because it's we're on a tight schedule. And I was like, well, that is, that is great, yeah, yeah. you know, so. It makes you win. Yeah, it makes you yeah. beat the other people, you know, when it it's does. hard to find a, an edge over a competitor, that is, a, that is an easy area to, to go and do it. Really you, is, you, yeah. Obviously, that's a piece of, of software. So you've, software's kind of come up a few times through this, You're talking about the software for DMCs. I know previously uh, you, you created some other software to 
to do things. What's, where's the software thread come from? I guess, is that the engineering background? Like, what, what, how's, how come you, you, you've zoned in on that so much? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I'm not highly technical, but I think, you know, my engineering was an incredible experience because although it was mechanical engineering, it, a lot of it was kind of business and systems. Um, there's a lot of how do we make this more efficient? How do we make this more effective, cost effective? You know, I was exposed to a lot of, I was in like a central consultancy for the whole of ICI and it was very business minded. So it was an incredible um, experience to have. And I've, or maybe it's, and maybe it's just me too, but I really love the idea of systems and, you know, what's the root cause of this? Don't just put a plaster on the top. How do we find out what's really going on the root cause and then how do we make this more efficient and effective and then just see how that makes people breathe a sigh of relief because errors stop happening you're not time wasting anymore you know and you know the best way to do that often is finding good software that that helps automate things um outsourcing to people who know how to do something much better than you could ever know you know there's different ways of doing it and all these things are a pain in the bum at the beginning aren't they like they take time to research and then oh it's money and have we picked the right one and then we've got to set it up and then we've got to train people and you can see things fail at all points along there like you didn't research it properly so you picked the wrong one or you didn't implement it properly and no one really knows how to use it so they don't use it they don't see the benefit you know so it's um you know and i think people want these magic solutions don't they um but yeah, I think engineering was what got me uh, into into systems, and, and I just see how it can make a difference, and it kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> people, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm like you could really be doing that better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, I think I think that you know some of what you're saying is a bit uh, sort of first principles thinking, isn't it? Like you, you know just going all the way back to like what you're trying to achieve rather than putting plasters on the mm. problem all the way down the route it's like mm. no i'm trying to achieve this goal what's the best way to achieve that goal let's go let's not take the long route around here let's there's maybe a, a direct solution that you can that you can get to or even do we split that goal out into four different goals and each of them has a separate solution to, to something um, yeah and it is interesting when you start to look at things that way and the answers are wildly different to yeah what traditional method methodology would have you would have you doing and i think what you said was interesting how you know i i'm very it's weird because i'm very right brain but i love systems um and i think what's hard for business owners is if you're a very creative type and a very right brain type it's like your idea of hell to sit down and like map out the process and you know, so, it, and I think that's what's hard when you're a leader and, and it's just you. And I think not, and maybe one of the problems is people don't know how to ask for help or don't want to pay for help. But I think there's a element in leadership of knowing what you're good at and not good at, but knowing that it still needs to be done and then kind of finding a way to do that, whether it be employing, you know, somebody else in the firm or, um, you know, a consultant or, or whatever. Um, but it's, I think it's very important for us to know what we're, good and not so good at <laughs> yeah yeah i've listen i i've you know i mentioned having a coach earlier like since i've oh, yeah. i've worked with two coaches and both of those have been yeah extremely helpful in sort of prompting me to think about things in a different way or zoom in you know zoom in in into ways i'm working things out and when you just have someone opposite you basically saying nothing just making you talk through it you start to immediately realize that what you do is stupid <laughs> it's like oh yeah obviously that's the answer and they don't even they don't say anything and the more you can kind of get into that relationship whether it's with a coach or someone else in the team like you say or the leadership whoever it might be um i think you'll start to make much better decisions or you'll start to realize what pr the real problems are that yeah that you have to deal with which yeah, kind of when you put your head down with the blinkers on and you just pedal in, I think you you miss a lot of those things. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And um, it doesn't even have to be expensive. Like it can even be, you know, an informal network of friends. Like you said, often if you mm. just have someone listen, you can come up with your own solutions, right? 
Because it's lonely at the yeah, top, yeah. isn't it? It's really lonely at the top. I, um, the, it really is. That, like I, again, like if, you know, when you were talking uh, when we when we spoke before before coming on, Becky, about yeah, kind of having that difficulty of no one's saying that's good or that's bad or you know people are people are kind of scared to say that for you know if they're kind of further you know down the down the the chain in the team um, and it and it is hard to get genuine advice from people and that's where the imposter syndrome thing creeps in mm-hmm. which again you you know you talked you talked to me about um yeah. so yeah i do think it's an important thing for someone to try and find someone like that who doesn't have to be an expensive professional they can just be a a person who sits in the room and lets you mm. talk it out for a while and you dedicate the time to it yeah and I, i've found you know being female too is, is brings in another dimension and you know it can be very lonely especially you know Beat and James were great, but there was no other women there um, to share that experience with because, you know, for no fault of men or women, we just are different, you know. Um, And, um, you know, I've recently joined Women Travel Leaders, um, which is a kind of association for women in travel. They meet every month and they offer different courses and, and and it's wonderful. And, you know, I wish that had existed when I was a, a via venture because, you know, living in Antigua, working with men, Latin environment, um, you know, I craved going to travel shows and, and having that camaraderie. And, and so I really, if they're, and, and I'm sure men probably feel the same just because they're on their own, you know. Um, so if, if you can find inexpensive things like that to join um, and just at least meet on a regular basis um so much of it is just to feel like you're not the only one experiencing a certain thing you know yeah yeah i think the you know obviously one of the excellent benefits of online and the world being smaller is you can quite easily find more people like that and find networks that um yeah provide that sounding board you know that sounds like a great uh, a great group I'll, so i'll link to that in the show notes at the end um Oh, great. To make sure people can go and find that. But, it, but yeah, find, finding something like that is, you know, pretty much does the job of the things that we were just talking about, of being able to go and bounce, bounce ideas off, off people. Because, like you say, if you're feeling it and thinking it, then there's probably hundreds of other people who are, yeah, totally. who are doing the same thing. So, what a great, <laughs> what a great idea. To, just moving it on then, Becky, from the, um, so let's go to, I guess, like, ch- kind of challenges. One of the things I always ask people is about, challenges what have been the most challenging times that they've been through or the biggest challenges that they've faced Mm. obviously we've had the pandemic the last couple of years which has been a kind of uh yeah a a one for everyone to to deal with um outside of that anything else that kind of springs to mind as as being a standout challenge for you i think just you know if i'm really honest leaving via venture and then trying to work out how to earn a living again um it, it's actually got tougher and tougher because as i said i think i left with ego and savings and kind of floated for a while and then you know a few years ago reality hit that you know i'm playing around with all these different ideas and and um you know um one of the things about working in travel, and I don't know if other people have found this, if you've lived in different countries, you know, I came back to Britain and I didn't really have, I'd been away 12 years and I didn't really have friends and community like people normally do because, you know, you often, you're in a job and you live somewhere and you have kids and you make friends and your partner has friends and, you know, and actually it's been really tough Um to, well, it's it's very, it's quite lonely, you know, and it's tough to make friends and it's been, and, and you know, we need a, a, a support group in life as we do in, in, in business. And so I think, you know, even before the pandemic, I was pretty, <laughs> pretty devastated, you know, I hit really low. Um, so I've hit lows and then I think that's a low and then it goes even lower, you know, and I think... Um, you know, depression is is a funny thing and, and you often don't realise that's what you've got. Um, so 
So I think one of my challenges is is having been on my own and not having any other income. It's been very hard, A, to focus because of the kind of person I am and to just pick one thing. And B, just it's been really scary. Like, how am I going to survive, uh, support my kid? Is this is this going to be something that's going to, you know, support me into, into my old age. And, um, Mm -hmm. and that's scary for people, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people are going through that. I know friends of mine, you know, especially through the pandemic, you know, who've never had to worry really about income and money before. And suddenly it's, it's this huge worry that you just never kind of thought Mm -hmm. you'd have coming from a a nice middle-class family. Um, so yeah, it's um I think motivation, keeping motivated after sustained, you know, years of of trying to innovate, trying to drum up business. And you know me, I'm we talked about this before, I'm rubbish at sales. Like I can't do the sales in the you know, the salesy way. Like my my marketing mm-hmm. style has always been kind of relationship building and being passionate about what I do so that people want to work with me um, and trust me I you know so selling squirrel fish for instance have been so difficult for me I've kind of I can't do that or I haven't you know got good at it yet Um, and just you know constantly trying to learn new skills and trying to you know at, at my age you know I'm hit 50 and you know I'm constantly trying to learn about different things, the digital marketing side of things. I mean, software is just evolving all the time, isn't it? Uh, and mm. and always at the back of your head, like, are you doing the right thing? Should you not like go get a job, you know, but you can't go get a job because you've got a kid. And um, yeah. yeah, just, um, yeah, just life stuff, I think. And just that realization that life's quite tough. You know, I think I had it so easy for so long. Like my life was just, wonderful adventure and and things went so well for for a long long time and then suddenly it's like oh yeah this is a bit tough isn't it <laughs> yeah 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 you don't this is it you don't know what's around the corner do you and you know even, like you say you come from the the privileged background and yeah i can it's kind of empathize with that of being like oh yeah it's all it's all ticking along and then suddenly you've just got this hammer blow out of left field and you, d- you don't know where the money's going to come from and, and what you're going to do. Um, I, I, you, there were a couple of threads there that you mentioned that I'd like to, I'd like to pull on. Um, the being a single working mum, I think, you know, one of those, you know, you, you highlighted obviously that at first, you know, you've got this business that runs well and you can kind of juggle that fine. But then when you hit the point where it's, not fine anymore yeah it's it's very challenging tell us a bit more about like your thoughts on that side of things and how it can be better what the particular difficulties have been gosh and obviously i say single mum because that's me but obviously you could be a single father or or whatever but um yeah i mean because i think it's hard to put a thing on because i only have her half time the time i have with her is very precious to me so that's why I don't feel like I could, I can't get a job because, well, also because I don't want to give up my flexibility, my freedom and my holidays, because that's also the time I'm with her and we have our big adventures together. So, you know, there's, there's a part of it is just my choice. Um, but, you know, when you're self-employed and on your own and you have a child, I mean, how people do it when they have more than one, I don't know. Um, but you know, you have to take them to school. You pick them up at three o'clock. I mean, that's hardly time to get to the office and set the computer up. And, you know, when you're trying to innovate and create, and it's not just a easy job, not, you know what I mean? It's not a like, do this, do that job. Mm-hmm. You have to build up to it and then you just get into it. And then you've got to leave um, and take them to brownies and take them to piano lesson and take them swimming and, you know, cook them dinner and then you know maybe squeeze a few hours in but you don't really want to because you're watching a film with them or something and you're (laughs) knackered and it's not good quality work right yeah and I've had a glass of wine um so that's obviously hard and I think if you were a single parent but you had them full-time you would probably work out a way that you had childcare or you 
did it with friends or, you know, but because I only have a 50 50, I've never really put much effort into that because I want to spend the time with her. And then the next week she's off, you know, with, with her father anyway. Um, and just financially, you know, I mean, how people afford childcare on a, on a single salary. Um, I, I don't know how, how people do that. So just the logistics of it, I think, and the fact that I, I, I go around in circles all the time about, should I just go and get a job? And then I think, well, I, I can't really, um, I have to make this work, you know, and just, you know, yeah. the, the idea of being on your own and you don't have a secondary income and you don't have some, you don't have another adult to speak to. I don't know if other people find this, but you know, I love my daughter dearly, but it's like so much time just with a child. I mean, at least now she's a teenager, so we can talk about, you know, pop music and boys, but you know, <laughs> when yeah. she's a toddler, uh -huh. you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I don't feel like a natural mother really either. You know, I think a lot of people feel like a natural mother and, but there's a part of me that's like, I want to be working. You know, I want to, mm. I want to build something. I, I, you know, I want, I need a challenge and, and, and that makes, it's, you're being pulled around a lot, you know. Yeah. It's a different psychological space, isn't it? To the like intensity of pushing the business forward and then a completely different mindset to being a, you know, quote unquote, but good, good parent. So uh, you know, I know one of the, there's something that comes up in like the Navy SEALs when they're talking about their skill set. And one of them is task switching and uh, uh. like being able to jump from one t task to the other is very in intensive on the brain, like, and not many people are, very, are good at it. And they kind of highlight that parents, you know, going, being a parent kind of trains you more in, you know, they tend to be better at task switching than others, but it, it kind of highlights how difficult it is to do that. And you know, the entrepreneurial side of it is another level of, you know, kind of that intensity and pushing yourself forward and feeling like you should be filling every minute with doing something productive or pushing something forward, which, you know, when you're then torn in that space of every other, every minute should also be looking after your, your child. And again, when you're in that kind of uh, single parent scenario, that time, I guess, becomes even more precious. So, uh, so yeah, I think it is super, yeah, super, super difficult. So maybe I should become a Navy SEAL. Maybe I'd be really good at it. Maybe you've missed it, <laughs> Becky. Yeah, maybe maybe that's where you've missed. You've been mucking about with this software and stuff and uh, travel. Yeah. You should have gone down the Navy SEAL route. That look <laughs> great in a uniform. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. New route, new plan. Only one more, one more thing to add to the mix. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> Listen, you mentioned you mentioned the sales thing there. Um, you know, I think this is a bit of a thread that we we share as well of not liking the again the kind of traditional you know I, I associate with the second hand car salesman kind of vibe of of hard sales. Um, and you talked there about the kind of more relationship building side of things. What you know, I guess what have you learned over the years of the sales approach and and how you do it? Because I think you know I don't think necessarily that's you know i think that's a good thing that you're talking about you you know you talked about being a people pleaser and like that's you know that's a good thing i guess you just need to be able to cut it off and say right this is the offer that is there and you can take it or leave it kind of kind of thing what what do you find difficult about about that and is there anything that you've done that has helped you overcome it in in some way yeah it's interesting isn't it because in as a travel supplier, you're not selling in the traditional sense of like, here's a widget, buy it. You know, you're, um, I mean, you, I guess you are if you're doing B2C, but predominantly most of, most of us are, uh, well, used to be anyway, B2B. And so a sale is, you know, in, encouraging a buyer that they, A, they want to, they want to be interested in your destination and, and B, that you're the right company for them. So it's really, a, it's not for me, that's not a problem because I believe in it and it's more a conversation and it's, it's persuasive. It's like, you know, you know, here's why it's wonderful and here's why we're wonderful. And it's a conversation and it's a slow burn and it's, it's getting to know each other. And then sales in the office is the same thing. I mean, you've had an inquiry coming in. It's not like you're not selling a widget. You're again, you're persuading with information and options. Um, and pricing uh, to get them to finally decide to buy. So I see that it's, it's a, 
you know, it's a different type of sale than both of those I feel comfortable with because um, I understand it and I like it. And, you know, I'm, I'm people pleasing, you know, I am, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make you happy. I'm trying to give you what you need and then you'll like me, you know? Mm. Um, but then with squirrel fish, it's like, give me, you know, I'm trying to persuade people to pay for a system and it's much more of a widget sale. And, you know, as, as you know, I'm living in the States now and, um, I sign up for, uh, for things once in a while like courses. Uh, so I signed up for a course for an SAS, um, SAAS system, so software as a service, um, to try and help me figure out how to, you know, how to get more people on Squirrelfish. And it's, you know, a bombardment of, you know, there's a whole, they have these systems worked out, don't they? That, you know, you need to bombard someone seven to 14 times before they'll purchase and your emails need to be like this and you, and it's just so like formulaic and salesy and it's cult it's cultural maybe too. Like I just don't like it and I don't it doesn't make me buy something. And I'm maybe it, and I'm sure it maybe it works on certain people, but like you say, it's that I don't trust it. I don't trust you. Like, you know, you're just so um I'm sure there is a middle ground, you know, I'm sure, you know, there are lots of sales courses out there. Um, I'm probably going to get bombarded by people going, you know, you need to do this course or that course or, um, but again, and I think it comes down to lack of confidence. You know, I'm, I'm very good at pretending I'm confident, but actually underneath it, I'm not really, which again is not good when you're in sales, uh, you know, um, which is why I'm good when I love, love what I'm doing. Um, I don't know if that answers yeah. the question. <laughs> yeah absolutely i think i think it's um yeah there's so many things that go into it like you say there's loads of cultural stuff on the kind of on the british side and uh you know the people please are things interesting like because because again the flip side of that is you don't want someone to go away not wanting you and you know i think one of the big things i've picked up from very clever good salespeople over the years is that you've got to be happy when people walk away mm. to be like they're not the right people yeah. for us or it wasn't the right fit or I you know I showed them what we've got and they didn't pick it and therefore that's that's okay yeah and then again one of the other things that has kind of come to light with it is that it's it's really in your head kind of getting to the stage of what's the other option but like if this person doesn't buy your thing are they better off or worse off? And uh, this, there's definitely a money thing in this as well, I think, for me of at course, least. Yeah. Where it's like you're sort of asking people to hand money over, which feels awkward or, you know, bad or in some way. Where, but actually the question is, if you're not, if, if, you, if they don't buy your thing, will they buy another thing? And if they do, will they be better off than if they bought your thing? And for me, the answer is no, absolutely not. I don't think there is a better solution for us out there. And therefore, if... I don't sell my thing well enough to make them think we're the right choice and they go off and do another thing, then I've, I've let the client down, uh, you know, because they're spending their money in, in, in the way that is not, is not right. Uh, and I guess that's, you know, it's kind of, if you can start to get into that mindset, then, um, yeah, I think it starts to help yeah. that, you know, that mentality of, of really, you know, pushing things a little bit harder and, maybe being a bit more vocal about how good your thing is which yeah. yeah doesn't come naturally to me and it sounds like it doesn't necessarily to you no well. and i think i think you're right the the basis of it all is self-confidence isn't it it's, it's self-confidence and valuing what you bring so that you charge the right amount for it and you know mm. and then like you say if people don't want to pay for it that's fine you just got to keep going till you find the right fit and you know, I say that to my clients all the time in travel kinship. Like, not every buyer is the right buyer for you. You know, you you can you can have a buyer that is a nightmare and wastes huge amounts of your time, um, and you don't want that either. You know, so yeah, but, that's it. That was the other thing that got taught to me is it was the yeah, like the ranking, your rating, your clients, and you know, you've mm -hmm. got the top level people who are the you know kind of brand advocates and all shout from the rooftops about you. Yeah. And then you've got the middle ones that are profitable and good and kind of sort of follow the path that you want them to. And then you've got these people down the bottom that are just like suck the life out of people and suck the profit and the money out of the business. And, 
you know people cling on to those people because they see it as money coming in but actually you need to get rid of those people yeah not you know they are a negative impact and yeah the more you do that the more space you make for your your you know your ab clients that and are, that's you know, you know that's a you. fascinating thing that and again people don't do enough of we used to call it client development plans um in via venture and it's something i want to get onto with my clients once business is, is back and running like people are constantly investing in getting new clients and they're not spending much time looking at the clients that they have and working out how to get more business out of them. And I'm always astounded how few DMCs and probably, and maybe hotels too, it's still, it's still useful, especially for B2B, uh, don't monitor conversion rate. You know, how many of the inquiries that you get from a certain client are booking? And then, and then what's what we used to do, map out different types of buyers. So like high sales, high conversions, there are amazing clients we want to look after but then how do you improve the conversion rates on the other ones? How do you, com you know, if someone's a really good converter, low sales, how do you work on that? And who are the ones that you really think we need to see what's going on here? And maybe they're not a good idea because we're getting like 20 quotes a month and not booking anything. So I've, I don't know, we're too expensive. Are we wrong? We're just wasting each other's time here, you know, and sometimes you can yeah. turn those around. Like you've got to give them a little bit of time, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating process um, yeah, it's tricky it's fascinating it's very tricky yeah kind of uh yeah a lot of it goes against the grain of i think what your natural instinct is um so yeah it's definitely it's definitely a tricky one uh listen time's absolutely flown becky so we're, we don't have much time left but i've got a couple of last things that i i want to cover before i let you go um talk it you know in terms of like your own qualities that have led to you know, the success of Fire Venture, you know, lots of these other cool irons that you've got in the fire that I've no doubt, some of which will, will go on to flourish. What, you've mentioned a few qualities throughout this, you know, kind of inadvertently, you know, the people pleaser thing, I think is, you know, we're talking about it in a slightly negative sense there, but, you know, obviously that is a great thing to be and no doubt will help you build great relationships with people and help with the marketing and the way that you go about things. Um, you've clearly got the like entrepreneurial brain and the ideas machine that is, you know, constantly churning out ideas. Um, I think the mix of that with your engineering background is like and the systems and things I just think is super interesting um, and not something that you really find very often having those, those two things run side by side. Is, is there anything else you'd throw in the mix with those things as to the like, you know, particular things that you think have led to, yeah kind of the the successes that you've had oh gosh that's really hard isn't it um i think i don't know if it's a i always want an adventure i don't want life to be boring i don't know if that's what you mean but i think that that drives me forward um you know that's what keeps motivating me that's what you know maybe is the problem of you know, starting too many things. Um, I don't know. It's one of those questions you probably have to ask the people around me. You know, I think I must have some strength inside, you know, to have kept going and, you know, deal with other things. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm impatient, which is a bad thing, but at the same time, you know, uh, it, it makes me, it makes me, you know, keep going and want things done. Um, yeah, I want things done. You know, I'm a doer, you know. Mm. Um, and I, yeah, I'm a people pleaser. I think people like me, people like to do business. Or if they don't like me, that's fine, you know, but most people seem to like to do business. Um, I think some people find me quite inspiring and, and that's kind of a big headed thing to say, but I really like that. And that, and that is a, if that's true, that's great for, you know, the things that I do with Travel Kinship. Like I want people to want to improve their businesses, improve the way they do things. Like I don't have all the answers, but half the battle is inspiring people to change, right? Um, so maybe something like that as well. Yeah, yeah, love it. I think that, uh, yeah, that desire to keep learning Mm. seems to run through the things you know you're talking about you you're always getting you know you talked about doing loads of courses and yeah kind of go 
branching out into different areas and picking different things up you know that's something i try and you know that's one of our big values here is uh, is doing that and i think that leads to that generally leads to to good things if you yeah if you combine it that internal motivation that you mentioned uh yeah, yeah you need it don't you to keep to keep pushing along and oh, uh, yeah. yeah make make things happen so um, so yeah no that all that all makes makes perfect sense <laughs> um so i guess to finish and just kind of draw things to a close a bit um there's loads of stuff I've yeah I've I've still got written down things about like the Atlas Association <laughs> I too much. and yeah ethical travel and all these different kind of things we'll have to do another one Becky at some point um but it's been yeah listen all the stuff that we've talked about has been uh, been super interesting so equally I didn't want to you know don't want to shut things down uh, to to do that um so we'll have to we'll have to come back around to it again or yeah join a network or start a network where we can carry on talking about it um tell what what would you say to someone to, uh, who's thinking of starting a travel business or they're just starting one that you know they're in the early days what what advice would you give to them what are the kind of biggest lessons that you've learned from your experience of getting getting to where you are now oh gosh that's a big question um i think especially in this day and age and it's certainly how we started via venture i think it's incredibly important to involve the local communities um, and involve people and that's a very broad thread um, but it's kind of like a Simon Sinek why thing you know like why are you doing this business so you don't don't do it if it's just to make money I think these days in travel do it because and I'm talking well I from a buyer point of view too like do it so that because you want to make a positive impact in the countries where people are traveling, but also for the people traveling. Like I think, you know, the term transformational travel comes up a lot now, sustainable travel, but also really you give your travelers the best experiences by working with the local people and making them super excited to welcome people and show them their culture. And also, you know, it makes money for them spread the wealth, get people off the beaten trail, show them things that they didn't know before. So, you know, product development is so key. And, you know, it's what's going to set you apart. It's what's going to keep you relevant and keep you fresh every year. Um, you know, excellent guides, developing your people, developing communities so that they come to you with ideas and they want to do it. And when people travel, they're just so welcoming and it's so important. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing I would say is invest in systems as early as you can um, and, and find someone who who likes systems and data to be part of your team. That You don't have to give them shares, you know, um, just have someone who's kind of practical and efficiency and effectiveness. Then you've got the creative side with the product development, but then you've got a strong, you know, running company like a, like a you know, you've got systems and like a franchise, you know, you've got your how we do business um, as well. Mm. Have you got any resources that you'd recommend on that front, Becky? Things that have guided you along the way? Courses or, uh, yeah, I don't know, websites or anything like that? It's a minefield. I mean, definitely accounting systems like QuickBooks, just get that going as soon as you possibly can so that you can report on your financials and know your profitability and no cash flow. Cash flow is a massive issue. Mm. Um, in terms of operations, there's a lot of different um, systems out there for different sizes of DMCs. I think it's really important. So you know, a, a back end, a back office system that looks after how you do your quotes. You know, you've got all your supplier prices. You can do quotes really quickly. You can still be tailor made. You can still be creative, but you know, it's it's a system so you don't get errors in pricing. And then that leads to guide allocation, driver allocation, hotel bookings, you know, keeping track of hotel bookings and confirmations, you know, in many countries can be an absolute nightmare. Um, and then payments, you know, and you can have one system that looks after all that and, you know, different, you know, your accountancy team look at one area, your operations team look at another and your sales team look at another, but it's all within one system. Um, and as I say, you can have fairly easy ones to fairly, uh, you know, to very complicated ones um i know a lot of people also 
uh, want lovely, beautiful itinerary builders, which I think is great for B2C, but I don't think is as important for, for B2B. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's that back office okay. system that's the, you know, it's, it's the everything. Yeah, the yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this episode is going to have the word system somewhere in the title. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely yeah, a prominent thing. And, and oh like I God. said earlier on when we were talking about it, it's not my... Like, it's not my thing, but it's the thing that over time, as I've learned, is like crucial, exactly as you say, and is crucial to making things work and not just having this chaotic business that things are running around and is completely out of hand and, and uncontrollable. So, yeah. yeah, I would certainly, certainly vouch for that. And I'll see if I can find any resources that I've you know, that have kind of guided me along the way to, to link to in the show. I can, well. I can give you a list of different software systems as well that are kind of friends of mine have been researching and you can always pop that in as okay. well. Yeah, fantastic. That would be great. very boring. Um, I'm the systems girl. Hey, How <laughs> I know, yeah, but listen, you know, it's underrated, Becky. It's underrated. Um, systems are sexy, man. I'm going to buy a T-shirt. I, well, I think the other thing might be, uh, yeah, another, another thing you said earlier on was the, you know the unsexy part of business so maybe it's like systems the unsexy part of business and something else we'll we'll throw in there <laughs> yeah not quite clickbait but hey we'll see how it goes well, you, um, you definitely put sexy listen, in the title then people will want to listen to it <laughs> yeah uh, yeah uh listen becky it's been so nice to talk to you um and Thanks, like i say it's absolutely flown by um it's been lovely to find out more about what you've what you've done what you've been doing as i said at the start I just think there's so many takeaways for people in there that um, that they can they can go and use and, and apply to their own businesses and, and their own lives. Um, tell us where the best place is to find you now, some URLs and, uh, you know, I think you're quite active on LinkedIn, aren't you? But yeah, where's yeah. the best pe place for people to come and find you? Yeah, definitely find me on LinkedIn and connect. Um, Travel Kinship is www.travelkinship.com. Um, and then I've got curious.travel and squirrelfish with a hyphen between squirrel and fish.com for the software um, but yeah it's fine on linkedin you know i love meeting new people and starting up a conversation and learning from everyone as you say yeah got to keep learning love it okay thanks becky take care really nice to speak to you thanks tom so lovely to see you see you when i'm back in britain absolutely bye, bye. and there we go i hope you enjoyed that one and enjoyed hearing from becky as much as i did talking to her you can find her on LinkedIn with links to all the different projects that she has on the go at the moment. And if you follow her updates there, you'll see as she shares more of what she learns along the way as those projects progress. There's loads of resources in the show notes as well that we talked about, uh, which I'm sure will be helpful for anyone who, who listened to the show and enjoyed that conversation. All those show notes and links are at seotravel.co.uk forward slash Becky hyphen Harris. That's B-E-C-K-Y hyphen Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S. And you can also watch the video of the conversation there or visit seotravel.co.uk forward slash podcast for all the other episodes so far where you can get lots of other insight as well. If you're a travel company looking for marketing support from people who really care about your success, then please do get in touch at seotravel.co.uk and we'd love to hear from you. You can also read more about our 100% initiative there which outlines how we give all the profit that we make from the business to educational charities, both at home and around the world. We'd love your support in spreading the world so we can help those charities as much as possible. If you did enjoy the show, it would be fantastic if you could review us on iTunes and share what your favourite bits were there. Subscribe to it and it'd be amazing if you could share it with at least one person that you know so they can benefit from the episode and the many, many tidbits that Becky offered there. If you haven't already, give our other episodes a listen. We've had some amazing stories from guests already in the first season and there's lots more to come in season two as well. So stay tuned for future episodes and when you do subscribe, you'll get notified whenever we release new episodes so you can be one step ahead of the game. Otherwise, thanks so much for listening. We really appreciate it. Any feedback is always, always useful. So if you have anything, please email tom at seotravel.co.uk and I'd love to hear from you. And until next time... Happy travels.